Hey, Michael C. Anthony here, Stage Hypnosis University, stagehypnosisuniversity.com. Thanks for clicking on my story. What is my story? My story is my story, the whole story. I'm often asked, how did you become a hypnotist? How did you get into what you do? And I give the short version because I don't want to talk as long as I'm about to talk to you right now. I want you to understand from the beginning to where I am right now, how it all happened. I'll be talking for a while here, but it's important for you to understand because I know that when I'm studying someone, I want to know more about them. I like to know where they came from and how they actually got to where they are. So that's what I'm giving you right here in my story. Okay, so I was born in Niagara Falls, New York. Uh, I was raised in Canada. There's all the little details. Uh, but let's fast forward a little bit to one of my relatives. His name was Joe LaMonica, my great uncle. And my Uncle Joe was a mailman till he was 40. Actually stayed a mailman, retired as a mailman. But when he became turned 40, he got into magic. He was a professional magician. He was a professional pickpocket. He was a stage hypnotist. And he was one of the forefathers of balloon artistry. One of those guys who uh, created all these balloons. You see people make dogs and things out of balloons. He was one of the beginners at that uh, way back in the day. He wrote books on it. And he was actually the guy, if anyone out there is a magician, uh, actually the guy who, he didn't invent flash paper. Flash paper is that paper you burn and whoosh, it's gone. But he knew the guy who did and the guy said, what do I call this stuff? My Uncle Joe said, how about flash paper? Boom, and the name still sticks. So he was my great uncle. And he used to show my brother and I tricks all the time. And we were fascinated with it. And, you know, always pulling coins out of our ears. And when, you know, we thought we really had money. We believed it was all happening. So I was a little bit fascinated with magic as a kid because my great uncle was a magician. That was kind of cool, right? So I never saw my great uncle perform stage hypnosis, which was, which is a regret of mine. I wish I had, but I was kind of too young. And although he performed until he was probably 80, uh, we lived far away from each other, so that didn't work out. I've seen him on video and uh, great stuff. So let's fast forward a little bit to my first experience with hypnosis. When I was a kid, I peed the bed. Okay, there you go. I peed the bed. And this was, of course, a problem for my mother. Didn't want to have to clean the sheets. So when I was probably eight years old, she took me to see a hypnotherapist. Okay, now this was back, way back then, uh, a hypnotherapist was a pretty radical choice, but hey, we were willing to try anything. So I remember like it was yesterday. There I am, eight years old, sitting on a chair, which was a huge chair for me at the time. And, uh, you know, my mother brings me in, talks, all the stuff, who's paying attention when you're eight years old, right? And so my mother leaves, and here I am sitting on the armchair and the hypnotist is saying, relax yourself, relax your arms, relax your hands, all the suggestions that he was giving. And then he says, okay, you can open your eyes. I open my eyes. And he says, so did you feel like you were hypnotized? And I remember saying no, because I felt the way I normally felt throughout the whole thing. He said, look down at your hands. I look at my hands and this hypnotherapist had put a pin through the skin on each hand, like this, okay? Uh, a fascinating test in uh, suggestibility, but people don't do that so much anymore, but it was a common practice back then to prove to someone that they were hypnotized. He told me to, for my hands to relax, be numb, didn't even feel him pick up my hand, put the pin through. My mother comes in, sees this, I don't think she liked it, so we were done. Uh, but I did stop wetting the bed eventually on my own accord uh, when I grew out of it at about 10 years old, 11 years old, runs in my family, whatever. But that is my first experience with hypnosis. So that was always locked in the back of my mind. Okay, I had a great uncle that did magic. He was also a stage hypnotist, but I knew nothing about it. And I had experienced hypnosis. Not that you have to experience hypnosis as a young child to become a hypnotist. You don't have to at all. So let's fast forward a little bit until I'm about 17, 18. I'm randomly watching television 
and the magic of David Copperfield comes on. And I'm watching it kind of skeptically, as a skeptic, and, but then he did a few things, this close-up kind of magic that was right in your face. Because when he did these big stage illusion stuff, you tend to think in the back of your head, well, it's some sort of camera trickery or a prop or a trick table or curtain or something like that. But when he did these things close up, it kind of blew my mind. And I was old enough to understand, look, this stuff cannot happen. So... I was fascinated by it. And the next day, I went to the library, which is what you did if you wanted to know something back then, because you couldn't go to the internet, it didn't exist. So I go to the internet the next day. I go to the, I go to the library the next day. And I get a bunch of books about magic and magic tricks. And most of the ones in the books were cheese, total cheese. Um, but I remember going through one of them. And it said, a lot of professional magicians get their props from Abbott's Magic in Colon, Michigan. Colon, Michigan. And so I thought, okay, I wonder what this is about. So I sent for their catalog. Their catalog came back to me. It was this thick. Nowadays, I'm sure they don't even have a catalog. They have a website. And it's if Abbott's is even still in business, I'm not 100% sure. Probably are. I'll have to check about this thick, and I studied that thing like you can imagine. I was all over it, day and night. And it would work something like this. It would say, the magician takes a handkerchief, red handkerchief, puts it in his hand, and poof, it's gone. 20 bucks, all right? And so I started buying these things. Now, a lot of the things I bought I'm going to say we're cheesy. Were they really cheesy? Probably not if you knew how to do them right, uh, but I didn't, and I wasn't very good at it. But I, I kept on going, I kept on going, and I started to get good at this. At the same time, let's say I'm about uh, 18 or 19, I get a job with General Motors, and it was a job just out of high school. And did I like it? No. Was the money good? Yeah, the money was good. Uh, so I'm working at General Motors and practicing this magic at the same time. And eventually, as I continue to practice and start to learn what kind of things I want to buy, what's good, I'm starting to get good at this stuff. With a deck of cards, I could blow somebody's mind right in front of their face with borrowed cards because I was starting to learn sleight of hand, which is the hard way of doing magic and illusion, uh, but it's the most rewarding way because you don't have to rely on some sort of trick deck of cards or anything like that. You can just do your thing, take some coins, poo, make them disappear, blow people's mind right in front of their face. So I'm working at General Motors. I'm practicing magic at the same time. Hating my job at General Motors because I grew up in a small town uh, in Canada that had General Motors where everybody worked. Everybody's father worked there. It's sort of just what you did. It wasn't even that hard to get in and get good money. So the thinking in my head, put in your 30 years, get out, right? Because that's just what people do. So I'm in GM for a while, uh, only uh, four years, hating it. Hating it, hating it. I'm thinking there's got to be a better way. So I was looking up different business opportunities. Was becoming a magician or entertainer in any way, even in the back of my mind? No, people didn't make real money doing this kind of stuff, do they? They do. But I, I didn't, I had no idea. So I looked up different business opportunities and I bought a cookie store franchise up in Canada inside a shopping mall. And when that opened, uh, I quit my job shortly after that opened and was running this cookie store. And the first year was good, profitable. Things are going good. And, but then a recession hits Canada, boom, it slows down to a crawl. So while things are slow, I'm struggling to keep my head above water financially. I'm still practicing magic like crazy, decks of cards, all that stuff. And 
they build a high school across the street from the shopping mall where the cookie store was. And so every day I saw these students pour in, rush into the food court, get their lunch. And so one day I think I'm going to show one of these kids a trick. Kid comes over to buy a cookie, show him a trick, freak him out. And he goes and gets his friends. Next thing you know, the cookie store is surrounded with people, three deep. I'm doing tricks and freaking everybody out. And so this sort of became a pattern. And I did this on a regular basis. And it's really where I honed my craft, my sleight of hand. Still not even planning on making this my job at all but it was just something I loved. It was my hobby. People would always say, why don't you do this as a professional? I'm thinking, how do you do this as a professional? I don't know. So one day, uh, a friend of mine, he became a friend through the cookie store. His name was Jack and his name is Jack. And he's watching my magic and he's thinking, wow, that's really, really good. You know, he, he liked it. He was laughing along with everybody else. So one day he says, let's go out to lunch. And we had no plan of making something happen here, but we would just go to lunch from time to time. So we did. A place called the Lone Star Cafe. Um, so we go there. I remember I was not there to try to get any kind of employment with magic or anything. I remember I went there with track pants on. I was dressed not to impress. So... I always had cards with me and coins and things like that. So my friend Jack says, why don't you show the waitress a trick? Show the server a, a, a magic trick. I'm like, okay. So I take out some cards. I don't even remember what I did. Pick a card, boom, boom. And she freaks out. Oh, well, that was funny. We had a good laugh. She, and she goes and gets the manager. Manager comes over. I, remember, I sort of remember what I did for him. The routine I haven't done in probably 20 years. Um, took a, I borrowed a coin of his, was making it disappear, all this crazy stuff, and then whew, I changed it into a coin this big, like a big coin. He's like, wow. And so he leaves, comes back a minute later, and says, you know what? You should show this to the main manager who's here. He's with a distributor over at a table. I'm like, okay. So I go over to this, this other guy, his name was Dave. And he says, so I hear you do some magic. I'm like, okay, yeah. And so I remember exactly what I did. I had Dave pick a card. I had his beer distributor take a card. They both chose their cards. I didn't look. And put them back in the deck, shuffle, shuffle, shuffle. Distributor. I said, okay, I'm gonna find your card. And fling, I fling it into the air out of the deck of cards, lands on the table. Boom, is that your card? Yes, it is, wow. And so I take the card, I hand it to Dave, okay, face down. He's holding it. And I go, say, you remember your card? He says, yes. He says, I'm going to change his card into your card while you're holding it. And he turns it over. Boom, it's his card. Next, I received a question that was one of the core questions that started to change the path of my life. He... He turned it over, saw his card, and just said, how much? And what he was saying there was, how much would you charge to do this? I'm guessing in the restaurant. So I did not know exactly what to say. All in one second, here's what happened in my head. I remember watching a videotape that was all about restaurant magicians. And... It said some of the highest paid, now remember this goes back over 20 years, uh, 23 years. It said some of the highest paid restaurant magicians. Now wait, let me define a restaurant magician. They'll go table to table in a restaurant while people are waiting for food, just you know, sort of kill the time, create an environment, that kind of thing. And the videotape said one, some of the most successful Highest paid restaurant magicians make as much as $60 an hour. Okay, that was in my memory. So he said, how much? And I said, 65 an hour. He said, okay. 
I want you to do uh, two hours in this restaurant on Tuesday nights, two hours in this restaurant on Thursday nights. I said, okay. So already four hours is 260 bucks. For someone my age at the time, amazing. Okay, I love it. But this was all by accident, remember. So me and Jack walk out of there thinking, wow, that dinner turned profitable. So I was doing that for a couple of weeks. And then Jack and I thought, let's do the same little song and dance, but on purpose this time. He said, yes, let's go to Marche Moven Pick, which was at the time one of the uh, it was the highest grossing restaurant in North America and different type of restaurant. Uh, but the, on the weekends, the lineup was an hour and a half to two hours long every Friday and Saturday night. I'd eaten there several times. It was everybody's favorite restaurant in downtown Toronto. And so I thought, let's try it there because I'd love to entertain that lineup because the restaurant is amazing. The only thing that stinks about it is the wait. So how about if you entertain the people that are waiting? So same kind of thing. We, we show the waitress a trick. She freaks out because she, she was a clown, uh, a part-time clown, okay? And so she knew what good magic was when she saw it. So she goes and gets another manager. This manager comes over. Wow, that's unbelievable. You need to set up a meeting with the main guy who was not there. His name was Klaus. And so... He said, okay, so I meet up with Klaus a few days later. I didn't know what was gonna happen here. And so I get there, it was like at, it was early, like 10 a.m. Because I think they opened at 11. I get there at 10, I didn't know it, but he had all the staff there and there were probably about 40 of them. It was a huge place. 40 of them, all the cooks, the, the, the serving staff, all that stuff. And I was to do a show. I'm like, okay. So I uh, did a show, 20 minutes. I don't remember how long it was. And Klaus at the end comes up to me and says, okay, how much, how much will you charge? So I told him 65 an hour. And he said, okay, four hours Friday, four hours Saturday. So now we're looking at 65, 130, 260 a night. So 540 with those. And when you consider the Lone Star more money, I was clearing about 700 bucks a week doing something I loved while this cookie store was doing poorly, losing money here. Okay, so that is how I sort of got into the entertainment side of everything, sort of accidentally. So let's go back to the cookie store. I had the cookie store here. Next door to us was a store that sold watches. And I was friends with the guy that ran it. He ran it for his father. His name was Rich. And he told me when I was doing tricks one day, he goes, that's amazing stuff. Boy, you've got some kind of power right? With the card tricks, which I don't. It's all just a learned skill. And he says, have you ever heard of Mike Mandel? I said, no. He goes, oh, Mike Mandel is a hypnotist. He goes, that's the kind of power I'd like to have. That's, that's what he tells me. And, and I'm like, he's a hypnotist. I said, my uncle was a hypnotist. And I always wondered in the back of my mind, what was my uncle into? What is this hypnosis stuff? Is he some sort of devil worshiper or something? I had no idea, right? I was totally naive to what hypnosis was all about, aside from what I got the, the needles in there. Um, but so I had this guy's name in the back of my mind. And so... You know, things are going, I'm doing magic in, in the restaurants and I, I'm flipping through a newspaper one day and I see that Mike Mandel has a show that is coming up in Toronto. So, and by the way, Mike Mandel, uh, his Hypnosis Academy is within Stage Hypnosis University, part of it, so you get a sample of it. Incredible hypnotist. So. I get my friend Greg and I said, let's go see this show, this hypnosis show, see what this is all about. And he, he does the show or starts the show 
And I'm watching like a skeptic. And I'm thinking, is this real? How is he going to get people to volunteer? Well, they came running up to the stage. And the things he did with the, with the, the volunteers and the way he did it fried me, blew my mind. I couldn't believe this was actually happening. I was watching it went in such a way that I'm thinking all the way through as I'm seeing people start to go. Now, I enjoyed what I did with all the sleight of hand. I still love the sleight of hand. I don't really do it for money um, unless somebody wants to pay. <laughs> but uh, that watching this hypnosis, I'm thinking all the way through, this is what I want to do. This is what I want to do. How do I do it? Let's back up just a little bit. I skipped a piece where, remember I got into magic and I would go to magic shops and things like that. Well, there was a magic shop in Toronto called Morrissey Magic. And my first trip to Morrissey Magic, I bought a few things. One of them was something called a thumb tip, which is a way magicians make things disappear. A few other things I don't remember, but one was a little book about hypnosis. And so I did read that. This was more just to tell me, what, what's my uncle into? You know, what is this stuff all about? And the way it explained hypnosis just made it sound too easy. You know, you say this to the person and this will happen. You say this and then they'll do this. Here's how you set up a, a show. And I remember thinking, no way. Can that, is that even possible? And didn't believe it. I mean, it wasn't definitely wasn't enough information to know how to run a business with stage hypnosis. But it was always in the back of my mind. So I had a tiny bit of education. See Mike Mandel. And my mind is just blown. So I decide, this is what I want to do. No idea how. Don't know who, what, when, where, why. I know I have nothing answered. I just know what that guy did is what I would like to do. How? So I start to study any way I can. I did something that was a considered now, I didn't know, a bit unethical, but I would go see, if I found out there was a stage hypnosis show happening with, within a couple hours of my house, I would go there and I had like a cassette recorder and I would record the show, okay? While watching it, while being amazed. And there were some guys that I quickly learned aren't great. They still got people up on the stage, they still hypnotize them. But the way this Mike Mandel guy did it was with such a flair. It was like a superstar. Other guys, I remember one guy was up there. He did it. He didn't even, he had a hard accent, didn't speak properly, but he was still making it happen. And so when I watched Mike Mandel, I remember thinking, I don't know if I can do that. The way he delivers, the way he's got control of the language is amazing. And I see this other guy do it, who I knew because of my magic experience, I already knew I can do it better than that guy. I have a better stage prince than him. I just need to learn everything. So I recorded these shows and then the cookie store was slow, remember? I'd sit back in the cookie store, I'd listen to them all, and I'd write down, this guy said this, this guy said this, and then this, this tape, this guy said this, this guy said this, this guy said this, and why? Would he do this here? And why would he do this here? I was creating a matrix of these shows, trying to figure out why does this happen here? Why when this guy says this, does this happen? Why does this guy do it here? This guy do it here? I'm trying to put everything together, which was crazy, but I'm just trying to understand it all and so I put this big matrix together and I start to write out a show, what I think is a show. And then I quit. I quit. For a year and a half, I quit. I just kept telling myself, was so full of self-doubt, I said, Mike, this is a dream, but it can't be done. So I put it on the shelf. I kept doing my magic at the restaurants, was having fun with that, wasn't making a fortune wasn't making nearly the money that hypnosis pays, but I gave up. It just too much self-doubt and I thought this can't really be done. I'm not the one that should be pursuing this. Carrying on, carrying on, 
Then a year and a half later, I'm sitting in my rocking chair listening to music, which is what I do when I'm, when I'm thinking. I usually do this late at night. And all of a sudden, boom, it all came back. And I thought, yes, you can do this. Yes, you can. Just pursue it. Just keep on hoping, keep on working, and something will eventually work out. Bring in another character to the story. His name was Ed. His name still is Ed. I'm sure I've lost touch with him. He's somewhere out there, Ed. He's somewhere out there. Hey, Ed. And if Ed would come by the cookie store and watch my magic. Remember, it was slow. I was losing all kinds of money. The money I was making from the magic had to go into the cookie store. Life sucked. And so Ed would come. I'd show him card tricks. He loved it. But he says one day, hey, you know what? I know the girl because Ed was a student, but he worked at Radio Shack. He says, I know the girl that books the shows at my college. You should do a show there. And I said, you know her? He said, I do. I said, can you get me her number? And he said, yeah. And I said, and these are words that also changed my life. Another one of the small things that you do, but turns out to be a giant leap. I said, tell her I'm a hypnotist. And he said, really? You do that stuff? I said, oh yeah, I can hypnotize people because in my head, I could. Remember, I was writing out this show. I was starting to understand things. Could I really do it? I didn't know for sure because I had never hypnotized anybody, but I was taking a, a leap of faith because, and the reason I wanted her phone number, I just wanted to set up a meeting with her. Tell her, I'm, I'm, I'll come over and we'll talk about it. I didn't want to talk over the phone. Why? Because on the phone, she'd start to ask me questions, things like, where have you done this before? I haven't done it. And it's not my style to tell a fib to anybody. So I, I just wanted to get her on the phone because I knew if I could open this whole meeting with some card tricks, bang, I'd have her attention. And she would automatically assume, if you can do this, you must be able to do this. That was my assumption anyway. So I go there with my friend Jack. And we get right into things. I show her some card tricks. She, this Hertz girl's name is Jill Baker. She freaks out and so do the students that are with her. So she just comes up, much like Dave from the Lone Star Cafe. She just said, how much is a show? I didn't know what to say, but I knew she wanted a show. And this is what I wanted in the back of my mind. So I just threw out $700 had no idea to say. She says, okay, $700. And the sh this was at the end of September of that year, and the show is going to be in January. Okay. So now we walk out of there with a deal to do a show. I'm booked at a college, and I'm thinking, I need in three months, to have this all figured out, who am I going to start to hypnotize? Who of my friends is going to be somebody that I can practice on? But here's what I already knew. I already knew if you're using your friends as volunteers, this is not good because your friends are your friends. They don't see you as a hypnotist, right? They know you, they know, all the different little details about you, you start to try to hypnotize them, they'll just start to laugh, right? So, so I decided that I'm not going to go that route. I'm going to try something insane. So here's my insane method. This is what I did. Very possible. I know others that have done the same because other students of mine, I've taught them how to do it this way and it works and it takes off all the stress from you having to learn, but it's insane at the same time. Here's what I did. I studied hypnosis like crazy. Every little detail. I wrote out a script. I memorized it. I practiced in my bedroom using a hairbrush as a microphone drilling this information in my head, drilling it down 
deep. So it was there, so it would just flow out of me. I was already entertaining a little bit, but I wasn't a stage performer. So I was creating a stage presence. And remember, rapport is so important. You have to go out there like you already own the world. Like you know this is going to happen. So here's what I knew. I knew that I'm not going to hypnotize anybody. I'm going to go in there cold. Sounds insane, right? But I'm going to have posters printed. And back in those days, posters were expensive. You had to, back in those days, if you wanted a picture on a poster, you can just throw a photo on a scanner or anything like that. Or you can just take a digital picture and enlarge it, things like that. You had to take a photo from a camera, put it through what's called a drum scanner, which was an incredibly expensive process, and print posters. But that's what I did. We printed posters. We put them all over the school. Because here's what this says. Think of yourself as an audience member. Here comes this entertainer. Here comes this hypnotist. You've never heard of him before. But there's posters all over the school saying, oh, he's here. He's going to be here, blah, 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 blah. You assume this guy's a hypnotist. Because why would there be a poster on the wall if he'd never done this before? Right? So that was my method, thinking if I can look good on paper, the people, and if I can have the show, and if I can go on the stage with confidence, build rapport, I, I, was, I was gambling, but I thought maybe it'll work. It's easier than trying to get my buddies and say, hey, could I try to hypnotize you? Them just laughing it off. And it would, it would destroy my confidence as a performer. So I thought, okay, that's my crazy method, and I'm going to do it. So here's the morning of the show. January comes around. I've been practicing like crazy, okay? Hairbrushes a microphone. Walking around my bedroom doing the show, going through each little segment. And... The morning of the show comes because this show at the college was, was in, called what they call a nooner, an afternoon show. And so I was on probably 12 o'clock. I don't remember. And that morning, I'm taking a shower and I'm sick. At least I'm telling myself I'm sick. Really, I was stressed out of my mind because I'm thinking, here I am. I didn't have any kind of formal training. There was no stage hypnosis university back then. I was just, I was gambling. Could I pull this off? And this could have gone horribly wrong for me. I, it's probably because I had uh, been entertaining with the card tricks and all that stuff. I had a certain confidence there. But my knowledge of hypnosis was so, it was almost nothing. Only, only some things I read in putting these shows together. So here's what happens. I'm sick, or I'm telling myself I'm sick. And I'm thinking, oh no, I need to phone there and tell them I can't do it. But then something inside me said, Mike, today could change the course of your life. You have to go. I thought, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. Jack comes and picks me up, my friend Jack. He was the only person that knew I was doing this show. I didn't invite any friends, nothing. I was too nervous. I didn't want it to go bad. And he picks me up. I'm not saying a word. He knows I'm scared out of my mind. I get there, and I think, nobody's going to volunteer. No, no one's going to volunteer, and it's going to be a disaster. I'm going to be humiliated. This girl, Jill, that booked me has full confidence in me. She thinks I can do this, but really I can't. So I remember saying to my friend Jack, Hey, Jack, before they introduce me, why don't you see if we can get volunteers to sit in the chairs? And he wasn't comfortable with that. And he said, No, I think you can do this. So they introduced me. I come out there like I've done this a thousand times before. And I couldn't believe it. Uh, I started doing things like a suggestibility test, getting everybody's hands closed. I didn't, I, I had figured out what I need to say. I didn't know if I was saying it right uh, because there's some, there's some real 
subtle details in there to get into somebody's head enough to make them think that, you know, they close their hands like this at the count of three, they can't open them, one, two, three, and they're like, ah, they can't do it. So I get there, say at the count of three, go ahead, try to open your hands. The more you try, the more they lock. And everybody's like, ah, they can't open their, right? the audience is freaking out. I'm freaking out going, oh my gosh, it's actually starting to work. But on the exterior, I'm just like, and it doesn't know, you know, I'm, I'm fully confident like this, that I was fully expecting this, but inside I'm like, it's happening, it's happening. So I'm getting to the induction. And you know, the induction is where you, you put people under and they're laying all over. And people started to go down. Their heads were going down, their shoulders were bent over, some people went on to the floor. I'm like, it's happening, it's happening. Jack, my friend, he can't believe it either, right? The, the, this thing that I talked about, this dream that I had, I'm actually making it happen in front of people. Probably, I'm gonna say 220, 250 people are at this show. I remember one of the things I did way back, I turned somebody into Madonna. This girl gets up singing, she's singing Madonna. This one guy, Tarzan, he ripped his shirt open, he's beating his chest. So I got a standing ovation for the show, having never hypnotized a person in my life. And it was a wild experience. It was a very difficult experience. It doesn't have to be difficult anymore because I teach you everything you need to know along the way, the subtle details that I wish I had. If I watched that show now on video, I'd probably say, oh my gosh, I'm terrible. They liked it at the time, uh, so good on me, but it could have been a hundred times better uh, with what I know now and what I'm gonna be teaching you with Stage Hypnosis University. So a standing ovation, having never hypnotized a person in my life, what, a crazy, crazy thing. So at the end of the show, Jill comes up, she's like, that was amazing, I can't believe it. What a fantastic show. Uh, can you come back in April? Already rebooked. I'm like, wow, this is amazing, because it's a spinoff where you do a good show for somebody, boom, you're gonna get back. And she says to me, uh, have you ever heard of such and such organization, which I'll give you all these details within the program, I said, no, I've never heard of it. And she said, you've never heard of it? You know, because she assumes I'm, a, I'm a, an entertainer that's been doing this for a long time. I said, no, I've never heard of it. She says, you need to go. You'll book all kinds of shows. I'm like, seriously? So that was locked in. Turns out uh, I come back in April and show goes amazing again. And I had booked one before that at another college in Toronto, which also went amazing. And so when I come back to Jill's school in April, I ask where this guy named Rich, which was someone she worked with, I said, where's Rich? And she told me, oh, he's in the, in, in, in the US and he's at such and such organization, a different organization. She says, you've never heard of that? I said, no. I said, oh, you need to go there because you'll book all kinds of shows. I said, really? So I ended up going to these organizations, which opened up the world for me as an entertainer and can for you as well. And I started booking more and more and more and more shows. Within four years, I was doing over 100 shows a year. Now remember, you can do stage hypnosis. If you take stage hypnosis at university, you can be a stage hypnotist. You can start part-time, depends what you're doing. Uh, I started part-time, remember I had that cookie store. Uh, about, I'm gonna say about a year after my first show, I sold the cookie store and I stopped doing the restaurant magic because I had to cancel on them all the time because I was in another part of the country or another part of the world doing a show. So eventually I said, look, I can't do this anymore. So I started booking a lot of colleges. I started booking a lot of high schools. Uh, I got into doing some cruise ships, performing arts, and my career is going great for years and years and years and years. And then, boom, the world stops. I go to the doctors. The doctor says, your creatinine level's high. I said, what's that? He says, all oh, that tells us about your kidneys. He said, uh, you need to get this checked out. So I go, 
only to find out a few days later, I was born with kidney disease. No idea. I said, well, how do I fix this? He says, you don't. He says, you get a kidney transplant. And you're going to need one in about four years, the way things are failing. And he was right on the money. So uh, I wasn't sick, but I knew inside my kidneys were failing. And there was going to be, uh, I couldn't reverse it. I tried, I tried everything. But instead of getting a standard kidney transplant, uh, I went another way. My dad found this random link on the internet where they're doing a, some high-tech study. See, the, the thing I didn't like about having a kidney transplant was you have to be on these hardcore medications your whole life. And the hardcore medications after your transplant can give you other problems from a cold to terrible diseases. So I did not like that. And so what this study was that I signed up for, I became a human guinea pig. Here's what the study said they're going to do. They said, we're going to kill your immune system. That means chemo and radiation. Kill it so you, till you have no white blood count whatsoever. Then we're going to take your donor, which was my brother Joe. God bless Joe. St stepped up right away. We're going to take his stem cells. He take, gets the stem cells uh, through IVs. He's had to do it several hours. while He watched movies while they took a stem cell. Put it through this machine of some kind. We go in for the kidney transplant. I get, they take his kidney out, put it in me, and then his stem cells into me. So my immune system, I'm somewhat of a robot. My immune system is my brother's. This, the immune system I have now is not the one I was born with. It's my brother's. Uh, long story short, I'm one of about, I think they're up to patient 25. Uh, I'm patient 15. So I'm one of 25 people in the world with a transplanted organ. Uh, and I need no medication whatsoever. So that was my health scare that sort of stopped everything. It didn't stop me from performing, but it made me question a lot of things, thinking, am I going to be ill? What's going to be the issue here? So I did have to take about five months off of work, five or six. And uh, luckily I was able to do that. And my first show back, I probably shouldn't have gone back. I was really exhausted after. And I look at photos back in those days. I even look at some of the filming of Stage Hypnosis University, the older videos, where my color's a bit off. I can tell, maybe you can't, maybe you can. Uh, my personality seemed different because I hadn't fully recovered because it took a good two years until I felt like myself again. Uh, even though I thought I felt okay, I'd look in the mirror and think, okay, I look normal, I feel okay. I start doing filming, but then I, I look back now and I think, oh, no. So we're slowly uh, rebuilding some of those videos. They, the, the content's great. They look good. But I can tell by looking at myself, mm, I wasn't 100%. I was probably about 85. So I go back to work and boom, again, everything it kicks right back into gear. Because here's the beauty. When you give people good shows, they just want you back because they want to bring in something that they know is successful. So I'm doing corporate, I'm doing, I'm doing college, uh, high school once in a while, cruise ships, things like that. Everything's going great. I even became a part of the illusionists, if you know what that is. They travel around the world. It's a magic show, highest grossing magic show in the world. Um, they have six magicians and me, the hypnotist. And everybody goes on and does a spot. I had like a, a 30, 35 minute spot, something like that in total. And these are amazing shows, theaters of 2,700 people. And we're doing it three times a day for two weeks, like in one place, dream gigs, dream gigs. And, but things continue to roll on, which is uh, what I want with a career. I look back to the days when I worked for General Motors. It just wasn't for me. I had a better dream. I, I want to be one of those people who wakes up and enjoys what they do for a living. And I'm blessed to be able to do that. Uh, when, I, when I had the cookie store, it was not me. I thought the answer was running your own business. Well, not a business that you don't like. Uh, I, I don't even know how to bake cookies. They, they came 
because it was a franchise, they came already prepared. I mean, I just had to put them in the oven. Asked me to bake cookies from scratch now, eh, don't know how. Owned a cookie store though, makes no sense. So I wanted something more for me and I was lucky enough to make that happen. I got lucky because I went in there with very little information. I could have failed. I do know some other people that did fail their first show uh, because they did not have the correct information or they accepted a show they should not have within stage hypnosis university. I tell you the parameters that you need for this first show to guarantee that it be a success. Uh, I know some people that got that first show and said, and I, and I said to them, I said, well, I really don't like this. You're gambling, man. He's like, um, I think I'll pull it off. Nope. There's certain parameters you need for that first show to make it happen. Look, you can do what you want to do in life. I had a desire to enjoy my occupation and to make more money. I make great money with what I do. James Allen wrote a book called As a Man Thinketh, Thinketh, with T-H on the end. And he said this, it's words that I live by. The visions that you glorify in your mind, that means the things you see, the things you think of, the ideas you hold close to your heart, this you will build your life upon, this you will become. He's essentially saying, if you think it's possible, and if you really hang on to it, work at it, you can make anything happen. I'm proof positive that that happened. My story will be likely 100% different than your story. Come from a different background, for sure. And you will, with the teaching of Stage Hypnosis University, be given the exact path you need to take and the different doors that you need to knock on to make that first show happen and to change your life, okay? So that's my story, I'm sticking to it. 